and thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, it is our hope um, and our goal is to help you increase awareness and knowledge and skills uh, of the mental health uh, workforce in trauma in the transgender and gender, gender diverse populations. All right, now our next speaker is Misha Kirsch Ito. But before, um, Misha, before I start introducing you, I know you have um, some, uh, uh, some, um, uh, what do you call that? Uh, um, An announcement. announcement? Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, Sabrina. Uh, so also, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Lamb, to the Lotus Project, to PHI, to NCTSN, Rams, uh, really everyone hosting us here. Um, before we get started on my portion, I would love to just have a moment of silence uh, to think of our fellow storyteller and our fellow poet, Marcellus Williams, um, who whose life was taken away earlier this morning. Um, I just would like to have a moment uh, of silence. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for participating on that um, moment of silence. Thank you, everyone. So Misha, oops, I lost my um, my paperwork. <laughs> okay, Misha Kirsch Ito is a storyteller from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, with over 10 years of experience in equity centered communications, design and systems change. Their focus is decolonize and gender affirming care as trauma informed care and anti racist institutional change. Between speaking engagements across the country, he also works with the White House Initiative for Native American, Native, I'm sorry, Native Hawaiian, Asian American, and Pacific Islander Mental Health, Health and Human Services Office of Trafficking in Persons, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network the University of Connecticut Center for Trauma Recovery and Juvenile Justice, and Local Efforts for Queer Trans Wellness. Please help me welcome Misha Kurs Ito. Thank you so much, Sabrina. It is such a delight to be here. Um, and after hearing that whole bio, I'm like, wow, I do stay busy. <laughs> um, so again, it's such a delight to be here um, and to be speaking again with Dr. Lamb. Um, I cannot think of anything more important in my life than uh, getting to have these conversations with y'all. So thank you so much for sitting down with me. Um, I want to get into things by uh, kind of introducing my work as life preserving work. Um, as you guys heard in my bio, a lot of what I do is around queer and trans mental health and well being. Um, in particular, I am going to be presenting today both from my professional lens as a suicidologist as well as a lived experience lens, being a queer and trans Asian person. So I kind of want to bring a holistic sense to this and, uh, you know, first and foremost, being a storyteller, I'd like to kind of bring you into my story. So to get started, I'm actually going to start with someone else's story. <laughs> so this is a kind of a composite case of some folks who I knew. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Kay. So Kay is a 17-year-old Taiwanese non-binary transmasculine person. Um, they've been on HRT for about a year and a half now. Their financial needs are pretty well met. Their parents are very supportive. And their goals are to attend college, major in dance, and become the next president of the United States. Um, <laughs> maybe not the next one, but a couple, couple sessions. Um, <laughs> so thinking of Kay, um, I really want to have a holistic moment to to consider what life like is for them, you know, and when we think about mental health and crisis care and well-being, actually what I like to start with is the story. Um, so I want to think a little bit together about what it would be like if we were K and we're going to the freshman mixer together, right? So the first time going into college, you might find there's a lot of different kinds of barriers for a young person. I have here on the right uh, a model that some you know, some of y'all may recognize. It is the uh, whoops, sorry, it's the minority stress model. Um, I have this version from University of Miami, but it's a pretty well used model. Um, and it's different ways to talk about 
what are the experiences of oppression um, in kind of a mental health context? So if we're K, we're going into the dance. Something that may come to mind is just, you know, in, in the prejudice and discrimination of what do I wear? <laughs> in a really simple way, you know, a college is a site where you might be meeting so many kinds of people, many folks of different backgrounds, um, lots of folks of different cultures and experiences. How do you show up in a way that you can look socially acceptable? And then beyond that, who do you take with you? So when we talk about internalized heterosexism, I intentionally didn't say here what K sexuality was. But there is a, a sort of performative aspect of being transmasculine where we have this internalized heterosexism. We have, a, 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 excuse me, a heterosexuality that lives in our brain fakely um, that we may expect that K might want to go with someone who is feminine. And so K might then expect that other people are expecting that they bring someone who is feminine. And so when you think about these two components together, these are situations that literally haven't happened yet. We're still, you know, we haven't gotten to the dance. We're still thinking about what to wear and who to go with. But it's a lot of emotional barriers that you have to go through for safety from learned experiences of learning what is and is not acceptable. And so when we talk about anticipated stigma here, this comes from direct experiences of culture as well as interpersonal experiences. So this can look like an interpersonal experience of back in high school, Kay went to the dance with their friend who was also masculine and someone made fun of them. So when we're thinking about going to the freshman dance, there's an anticipated stigma that lives inside. And then when we get to this last step of concealment, it's the reason why Kay's not wearing their favorite outfit to the dance, or maybe not going with their partner. It is a lot of different layers and barriers that kind of exist between just being able to go out to a party and being able to go out to a party safely. And so when we think about, you know, what is crisis care? What, how do we get to these uh, moments where folks are in crisis? I always like to go back to this chart and think really clearly about, well, where did it start? <laughs> and the answer is rarely ever with the person. It is always, always, always going to be with society and the culture. Um, so I open with this case study and I really wanna emphasize it here because this is actually a case study based around um, a couple of my friends who passed away. Um, they are folks who were younger than I was actually, whose funerals I had attended while I was in college. And I really want to bring forward their stories because I think so many people want to uh, presume that it is complex to intervene in these systems, but actually I'm gonna give you guys some tools that will make it a little bit easier so that collectively uh, we can address some of these components. So 36%, this is not a fun number, but uh, as suicide, I always like to start with these kind of statistics. We have 36% of LGBTQ plus NHAAPI adolescents considered suicide in 2023. This is a 4% decrease from 2022, which we love, but 36 is a huge number. That means more than one in three. If you get a room full of six LGBTQ plus NHAAPI adolescents, at least two of them considered leaving this plane in the year 2023. That's a ridiculous number. And although it is really on par for, you know, uh, different categories across different oppressed peoples, I think uh, the story that's always difficult to tell is that this number is much lower than the actual number. Um, we know that underreporting happens. We know that what is considered a suicidal behavior and how that is reported is really varied. But we can say with great certainty that this is at minimum a number. And so that feels like crisis. Um, when we talk about 
the cause of death generally for uh, NHAAPI young folks, thinking of people ages 12 to 25, suicide is actually one of the leading uh, causes of death. And so this number has a, a lot of meaning for me, but I think it also gets kind of tossed around a lot. So as a researcher and as someone who is really committed to stories and the truth, I wanted to think through it a little bit more with y'all. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm also uh, someone who does equity work. And I think this is my act of equity for today is I wanted to disaggregate the data. When we talk about our communities, especially LGBTQ plus NHAAPI plus communities, with all those letters, I just listed like over a billion, like a couple billion people. <laughs> So in a big way, trying to tell all of those stories within a single narrative or a single statistic just doesn't quite work. Um, so I, I'm kind of inviting us to take another look at this and, you know, look at the disaggregated data across race and, excuse me, across race and ethnicity um, to get a, a bigger and fuller picture. So looking at this, we can see here that our native Hawaiian and our Pacific Islander siblings have a significantly higher rate of uh, consideration as well as attempts. And when we think about why these things may happen, again, to think of the story in the big picture, I invite folks to remember that Hawaii is a colonized place. It is a currently and actively occupied place. Same thing for Samoa, for Guam, for many of the Pacific Islands and Oceania at large. So when we think about things that contribute to mental health and well-being, we know that generational trauma of being colonized and actively being occupied is a serious barrier to mental health and well-being. Even now to actively receive services has generations worth of red tape uh, and significant barriers, whether it's language barriers, whether it's financial barriers, whether it's systemic barriers of where the closest practitioners are. There are so many reasons where uh, these barriers become really evident across the data. Another point that I wanna uh, talk about for a little bit, again, in talking about the purpose of disaggregating data, um, is where we can get a little bit more granular on what youth experiences really are. Um, so when we think again about uh, what are protective factors for youth, being out to at least one parent is across the board really helpful. <laughs> um, I'll even share from my personal experience on this one. I can speak a little bit to it. I'm a uh, uh, white and Asian. And when I first came out as trans, I came out to my white mom um, and it went all right. Um, she said some things that are a, a little less than stellar, but it went okay. Um, and I just begged her not to tell my dad. Um, and then when I went to tell my dad, finally, I remember clearly he was uh, making brunch for us. And I explained to him and I said, I think that I'm non-binary doesn't mean that I'm a boy or a girl. It just means that I'm your child. And my dad looked at me and he said, okay, well, would my child like three or four pieces of bacon? Cause I need to get the bacon off the stove. Um, <laughs> and I think in a lot of ways, uh, I had kind of made up in my mind this immense amount of cultural stigma that my dad was going to bring into this conversation. and. I had a lot of fears that he may not be able to really connect to some of the emotions that I was bringing to him. Um, but in reality, he was much more attached to it. And in fact, over time, I've come to trust my dad significantly more. Um, so when it comes to being out to at least one parent, I again wanna emphasize, I think a lot of folks uh, working within the queer and trans world kind of have this white supremacist view that white parents are going to be more accepting of queer and trans kids. I just want to dispel that in a really big way <laughs> and say that uh, that is not necessarily true. And in fact, when parents of color are able to tap in, it is so significantly helpful for their youth. 
So to bring it back to this graph that we're looking at, um, I also want to think about folks who are not able to be out to at least one parent. I know Dr. Lamb emphasized, you know, it may be that folks have this feeling in their sense of self, but they also understand that there are some big structural barriers around celebrating their self fully with everyone in their life. Um, so when we think about this, the overall national sample across all race and ethnicity is like around 29% um, of youth are not out to at least one parent, but within our little NHAAPI bubble, those numbers are way higher. And that's something that we uh, can deal with as a community, but I think it's also something that comes from uh, who we are as a community and where our culture uh, has kind of been a part of our upbringing, whether it is upbringing from parts of our culture that we know and love for our family or inheriting the generational traumas of colonialism, of imperialism, um, where we know that queer and transness then became uh, something that made our families more vulnerable. So with all that in mind, I just wanna take a total flip of the script and get strength space with you guys. Um, because it is my foundational belief that culture is crisis prevention. Um, again, I think that quite often we think about uh, culture maybe sometimes being a barrier towards getting services because of an overwhelming amount of stigma. Or we can see it as a, a barrier to being able to come out in that way. But I am here to very confidently tell you today that it can also be one of the most defining strengths and one of the greatest ways that we can actually come together. So before I get into the rest of my presentation, I'm gonna take a quick pause and invite the chat to come forward. We have a quick little history lesson. I would like for everyone to write in what you think, which is the oldest? Queerness, the gender binary, or the Horiuji Temple, which by the way is the old oldest building in Japan, I did check. <laughs> I'll give you guys about a minute to go ahead and write in. I love it. I love that I'm getting a variety of answers for this one. So, drum roll, the answer is queerness. Woo! Um, there was probably queer people working on that building, I'm not gonna lie, um, but <laughs> uh, in a really big way. Um, I have this in here because so many people understand queerness and transness as this kind of nouveau thing. But in reality, uh, there is evidence of trans people as far back as 7,600 BC, 7,600 years before the, the common era people were still transing their genders. Um, and so I really wanna elevate this again because we're not new, we're not going anywhere. But also a lot of folks put in there the gender binary. And so something that has always been really near and dear to my heart is that queerness is everywhere. There has always been an abundance of uh, diversity within the human nature and behavior. The gender binary is actually a really new thing um, the fact that there, you know, may be at least two or more than two genders, not new. The idea that there are only two genders and that those genders are only biologically determinant by, you know, a certain amount of things, very nouveau, last couple hundred years at most. Um, so again, I want to elevate that when we talk about things, like quite often I get folks, you know, saying like, oh, do you think that queerness and transness is happening more now because of social media? I'm like, oh, I mean, like 3000 BC, they didn't really have Instagram yet, but I think uh, <laughs> there's there's a little bit more complexity to it. Um, so thank you for humoring me with that. Uh, <laughs> and another thing to, uh, to be a little historical about, as I mentioned, the gender binary is really new. Um, the idea of being non-binary is also really new because we didn't have to have a non-binary until we had a binary to react to. Um, and a lot of ways that binary comes from enforcement across colonialism, imperialism, and a lot of violent means. Um, there is 
worldwide folks who felt that they were men and women and many other things for all of time. Uh, it's just really recent that we're kind of using violence to only let people be men and women. Um, so then when we talk about non-binary, I also want to elevate this idea of like a false trinary that I see a lot coming out of like <laughs> men, women, and non-binaries, femmes and non-binaries, trans people and non-binaries. Like I really, really love that non-binary as a word is getting its spotlight, but I also want to emphasize that any gender that is not man or woman is non-binary. So... <laughs> Over here, I have a lovely chart of genders that some of y'all may notice and some of y'all uh, may, uh, may be seeing for the first time. Um, in a recent study, uh, turns out of trans youth, around 60% of them are non-binary. I myself am non-binary. So, you know, I'm really pulling uh, for the non-binary flag here. But I also want to elevate that this is not a new thing. There's actually a lot of historical and culturally embedded terms that celebrate gender diversity. And I also want to elevate in particular that some of them uh, are closed practice and use and some of them are open. So for instance, uh, an open practice word is non-binary. Um, that is in English and I will even give credit to like an American centric word, um, but it really describes any gender that exists with, uh, outside of or without reference to the gender binary. Um, if you want to get really historical, I also have on here Wakashu, which I love. Um, it's actually a hyper specific and uh, I will say calling it a gender is kind of like an asterisk moment, but um, it's kind of a combination of gender expression as well as gender that really only has use within the Edo period and really is only useful for like Japanese folks who are uh, assigned male at birth and use that specific language for themselves. So already that is like a very specific enclosed kind of practice within gender, but it celebrates the diversity of how gender is forms and practices within social circles. Um, to get a little more on the recent statistics, again, we're talking about life affirming care. Um, how do we actually know this stuff works? <laughs> You know, like, why are we listening and talking about what a gender could be and what non-binary is? What, why are we doing this? So uh, a 2023 report found that when trans adults asked if they were more or less satisfied in life when they were dressing and acting as themselves in public um, and also having folks treat them as such in public. Um, so looking at this beautiful, beautiful graph, you can see 78% of trans adults said that they were more satisfied with life when they could be themselves. And if we think of Dr. Lamb again, elevating the idea of autonomy, autonomy as a key component of mental health and practice, this is the statistic that really affirms that being able to call yourself what you would like does so much for one's mental health and well being and their satisfaction with life. I have a couple of other uh, percentages over here. I have here 45%, which is uh, unfortunately the percentage of queer and trans youth who have considered uh, suicide within this year. And then 56%, which I think is the kind of counterbalance, which brings me joy, which is uh, the percent of folks who uh, experienced a reduction in these kinds of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors when they are met with gender affirming practices like using their name and using their pronouns. So again, if you're gonna take anything home from this, it is that queer and trans folks have been around for a very long time and the easiest way to help queer and trans youth of color is to let them have the autonomy to be who they are. To get a little historical again, um, I wanted to pull up a map of all kinds of genders, <laughs> different ways that we can actually really uh, do affirming practices together. So we think about affirming cultural practices, history is always going to be my first option. Um, there are such an abundance of histories of all kinds of genders across the world. I would absolutely encourage you to take some time to dive into your own cultures and learn a little bit more about who all uh, has been doing all kinds of whatnot there. 
um, I almost guarantee you, you can find some sort of gender diverse component within your own culture. Food, I love this part. <laughs> when we talk about what is a good life affirming practice, I always say food. Um, and I really have to especially say within the context of uh, NHAAPI folks, and I'll even specifically say within myself as an Asian American person, I think food has always been a big, big part of my ability to relate to my family, to relate to my community, and to really make space for myself. Um, and in this way, we can actually also use it as a gender affirming practice. So there's a lot of gendered practices that come around, you know, festival time for some of us. But even the simple act of being able to say to your trans feminine daughter, like, hey, do you want to lead the dumpling party this year? Like, there are really beautiful ways that are so embedded in uh, our everyday practice and culture that we can use to invite affirmation for the people in our lives. Oh, and of course, I almost forgot, it's an easy way to connect without words. So also, if you're finding that folks uh, don't have as much connection across language or maybe have trouble with connecting across language, or even if talking can be harmful, maybe we can just get along using our hands. And so there's a lot of different interventions that we can pull from this one that, that allow us to get together and gather together meaningfully. Um, the other one being art and music. Oh my goodness, is there queer and trans art and music from Asian people? I mean, good God, yeah. we have so much to pull from. Um, and I think it is such a beautiful thing that uh, we can actually sit down together and experience these art pieces together. It's a great way for families uh, to really connect with the different emotional components of storytelling. And it also provides this additional resilience for queer and trans youth to see themselves in something, to, to have the idea that they themselves as a young person can be queer or trans and can also age, can also have a life, can have an adventure. Um, so I really wanna elevate the power of storytelling through art and music as a beautiful life affirming practice. Um, before, we head off. I just want to have a quick shout out to the NQAPIA. I am such a big fan of them. And in particular, this is the Family is Still Family series. I'm not going to play the video, but if you have time, I would highly encourage it. Um, it's a bunch of queer adults with their parents um, really making time to speak about their beautiful bonds with their children. Um, I see Sabrina coming off, so I'm sure I'm about over time, but yeah, <laughs> I just want to elevate. Have, no, you have two more minutes. Oh, perfect, yes. Um, last but never least, uh, I want to elevate one amazing star in the sky, um, one of our amazing Mahu sisters who has really taken center stage in the last couple of years, Queen Mother Sasha Colby. Um, <laughs> And I'm going to quote her and end and out on her words, um, which I think really sit with my heart. I think it's vital that we, trans people, are shown being successful and being happy for the trans kids and trans people of color that don't have the outlets to perform or do the drag or even walk out of their house. Those are the folks who I present for. Um, so thank you very much for joining me today. It has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, and I, I hope that you've learned something wonderful. Thank you. We definitely did. That was a great presentation. Um, <clears throat> how should I call you? Ito? Oh, would you like your first name? <laughs> Ito. Yeah. Thank you. Very informative, Misha. Thank you so much. And thank you for including Sasha Colby. I've met her in person twice. Yes, great performer. Um, we did prepare... Oh, wait a minute, we have a question. We have a question that came in, but also we prepared some questions for you if we don't have enough questions. So one of the questions is coming, uh, the question came from Christy Tham. How is it possible to have queerness without a gender non-binary? You want me to repeat that? No, I got it. Okay. I, I love that question. Um, so I've been thinking about this a lot too, actually, and that's why I love the question. <laughs> I've been reading more and more about, um, there's a particular book called Black Trans Feminist Thought. I really encourage folks to pick up. 
um, that really helps to define queerness as engaging with ulteriority. And so I believe uh, that definition really lives within me in that same sort of way, where queerness isn't necessarily to do with uh, the point of reference for what the primary social structure is. It is only referential to the fact that there is uh, an alternative to it. So when we think about uh, queerness and the gender binary, it's not necessarily that we need a gender binary to have queerness. It's that the social structures of our world have produced queerness as a byproduct of asking folks to exist within these smaller and more specific boxes. So it's kind of like both of these things coexist together uh, in a meaningful way, but I think we could still be queer without needing to decide that everyone else needs to be in some boxes. Um, it's just that exactly, you know, the historical coming together of these things. <laughs> you know, I just wanted to, um, um, it isn't a report, or I just wanted to add from our own uh, intervention that we do uh, at Hip Hop, 50% reported from queer, uh, queer gender non-binary individuals. 50% of them reported rejection from family members, even kids, siblings, all that. And 10% of them actually said who, who came out as queer, experienced violence from immediate family. So it's, got, it's coming from immediate family members themselves. And I believe I would say 10% of them were kicked out of the house for being queer, for being gender non-binary, of course, and also being trans. All right, we have another question for you. All right. Asia is so big with a variety of difficult cultures, just for East or South part, part of Asia. From your observation and experience at work, what are some of the big differences of challenges for different cultures? It can be a very freestyle question. Some cases and or intervention can be shared. Yeah, awesome. So Sabrina, exactly as you said, uh, you know, the idea of Asian is already describing so many people. <laughs> so I think to, to describe, uh, you know, how it looks across cultures, yes, it's absolutely going to look different. Um, and a lot of that has to do with obviously the individual and your own personal history. Um, but a lot of it also has to do with the shared history across cultures. So I'll, I'll speak lightly into that. Um, I'm specifically Okinawan, for instance. And so uh, it's something that I think about very often is the imperial histories that uh, live within me. So the, the histories of being imperialized by Japan, the histories of being imperialized by the US. Um, that in itself is a very specific kind of intergenerational trauma and that within itself is going to be vastly different than for instance one of my boyfriends who uh is you know born and raised in beijing is a city boy and has a really different understanding of his relationship to things like land or the way that they speak about uh you know even going through the city so i think to to try and understand uh anyone within these contexts is always going to have to go back to the person first. Um, there are always going to be huge cultural differences, uh, everything from where you are literally from and who you are to the journey that you have taken as an individual in understanding that. Um, huge, huge, huge differences. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? Okay, well, you know, we're waiting. But, you know, as uh, growing up in Asia, um, before I came to the United States, I was called the third sex growing up. Because at that time, although I don't identify as queer or gender non-binary, at that time, we don't have the, those terminologies situated yet. Yeah, so oftentimes, when citizens could not identify with you, they're calling you the third sex. So just from that, that actually there's a lot of transphobia involved, red transphobic remark involved. Okay. Yeah. And even, you know, the language itself, that's uh, 
something that I think we talk about is what what is calling something due to having a body in that way. And I think you're exactly naming it is what does the language do to us as a place? Yeah, thank you so much for saying that. Do you believe, um, Misha, that people who are in that, um, the population of being gender queer and gender gender uh, gender queer and gender non-binary are actually uh, on, on on the terms of being out or being open about their uh, sexuality and gender. Do you think they're getting uh, the services they they actually are seeking because of their gender identity? Does that make sense? That question. Yeah. So that's a that's kind of a complex one. Yeah. Um, we know to an extent that there are more folks we can be helped across the board in, in, in most mental health homes. Um, but I think especially when it comes to finding correct services and culturally appropriate services, it can be really difficult, um, it, especially when it comes to particular understandings of gender that don't transcend race and culture. Um, you know, for instance, I was trying to describe to a researcher the other day, it's like, you know, how would you call your gender? And I was like, well, ideally it's something to do with spiritualism really, and much more to do with how I feel about my self and like the earth and the culture. But I guess you can just write non-binary. So I, I, you know, I think in a lot of ways, um, <laughs> it's exactly that. It's like trying to toe the line of what is the actual experience? And then what are the special words that we use that actually gets us care? That actually gets us yeah. in the door. Yeah. Um, so I think that there is also a huge discrepancy within care, whether it's mental health care or and in physical health care as well. Um, kind of the words that we have to use, so to speak, uh, to get into the door and get to get insurance to pay are different always ah. than the actual experience of feeling of gender is. Yes, yes. Okay, another question. Thank you. Thank you, Misha. Another question. So could you repeat the name of the book you mentioned and recommended? Yes. So, I believe it is a Black trans feminist thought. I'm going to search it up right now because it's on my bookcase in the other room. But <laughs> I will find it momentarily. All right. Okay. Um, well, uh, if we don't have any more questions, uh, we would like to thank and appreciate you, Misha. Thank you for um, this beautiful presentation. Very informative and also, again, powerful. Thank you so much. I hope everyone learned, everyone got something out of um, something. Um, something that we can all use in our um, mental health uh, work and um, work that we do in our communities all over the world, I guess. Thank you. And I will give the uh, microphone uh, to Kuya. Thank you, Kuya. Thank you, Misha. Yeah, so I'll just have some concluding logistics. Thank you everyone for taking the time to learn us today. And thank you to our own amazing speakers. And thank you for Sabrina for your moderating the section.